Hi, and welcome to the Thriving Writer Show. My guest today is Liz Wilcox, and she runs a website called The Virtual Campground. She uses humor and storytelling to deliver her message. Welcome to the show, Liz. Hey, Frank. Thanks for having me. I re I'm really excited. Well, it's great to have you here. I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. Me too. All right, so uh, you told me you were making some money with your writing, and I was just wondering, uh, what type of work are you doing to make money? Awesome. Well, of course, I wrote a book. Um, it was actually a compilation of stories that I got um, other bloggers and writers within my niche to share, and I compiled them together in a book. Um, and they're all RVing stories. And within my niche, of course, it's a lifestyle. So everyone is trying to sell the lifestyle. And this book is different. It is telling the true stories of RVing in a humorous way. You know, like when you have a bad day, um, mm. you know, it's not normally something you want to talk about outside your circle of friends. So I got all my friends to give me their literal, like crappiest stories about RVing. And I put them in a book and um, taking the advice of smartblogger.com, I created my own product instead of putting ads on my website. So on the sidebar of my site is an ad for my own book. And so the more traffic I get, the more people see it, the more people buy it and they can buy it directly on my site. And also I write for a um, company that's related to my niche. Of course, my niche is RVing, so it's an RV rental company. Oh, and one more thing. The book, of course, it's a compilation of stories. Only one story is mine in it. So everyone has an affiliate link, and they can sell it on their own. And the beauty or genius, I think, of the book is that I got other bloggers and writers that want to make money online to contribute. So they're wanting to you know, use the affiliate link and sell it. No, oh, that's awesome. I love that idea. That's a Thanks. pretty entrepreneurial idea there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, if somebody wants to do freelance work, uh, how does somebody go about that and get their first job? Okay, uh, this one is really something that in the RVing world we love to do. We love to freelance because we're always moving around. You know, we want to diversify the income so we can keep traveling. And a lot of people have found great success on Upwork. And uh, like the title suggests, um, it does take quite a bit of work to get started on there. You might want to try to, you know, price low and um, or do something, you know, that you normally wouldn't do for such a price just to gain those reviews because it, it's um, like a market like that with reviews. Um, you simply ask other people for work. If you know someone that works for a company or m might know someone who dot, 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 you know, simply ask, sit, put yourself out there. I find that's the number one thing that holds people back is themselves. They're not willing to say, Hey, I need that work or, Hey, I'd love to write for your company, which, um, a lot of companies and people looking for freelance work are on Instagram. Learn about hashtags. It sounds so silly, but that's how I got the writing gig that I have right now that provides um, most of my income online. They actually found me through my book, through Instagram, and it wasn't even something I had posted. It was someone else who had posted who knew about tagging and hashtags and all that before I even knew about it. And that company found my website, bought my book, emailed me, and reached out to me to start writing for them. So I would say whatever niche you're in, if you're looking to freelance, there are people looking for you online on Instagram. So that's my number one piece of advice that I think not enough people know about. And that has literally put me in the position I am to be location independent. If it wasn't for finding that gig on Instagram or them finding me, I would not be able to be on the road today. <laughs> wow, that's pretty awesome. Uh, you mentioned hashtags. Uh, is there a good place to find out what hashtags are working in your niche? Um, there, yeah, there are a few. Um, number one, ask your friends. Again, you know, I always say you have way more resources than you know of. So. Mm -hmm. 
get in those Facebook groups, start asking people. There are apps. I forget the name, honestly. <laughs> I forget the name. It's like hashtag trend or something like that. There are a couple apps. Um, but seriously, my number one rule is to just ask my friends <laughs> because they know things that I'm not looking at and they're always willing to share, especially in the online space. And it's fun to talk to your friends anyway, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And it gives you an excuse to stay online when you probably should be writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty right here. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, so you not only live for the road, you said that you live on the road. Now, uh, how did you get into RVing in the first place? So this is a pretty odd story, but I guess um, anyone that RVs has an odd story. Uh, my husband was in the Army, and we were moving from upstate New York to Alabama, and two days before we were set to leave, the deal on our house fell through. So, uh -huh. And we were moving to a university town where they had their highest enrollment rate ever, so there was nothing to rent, and there was nothing to buy that was within our price range other than that one house we were looking at. So the deal fell through. My husband had always joked about living in a camper and I always shrugged it off, you know, like I'm a dignified woman. I would not live in a camper. I have a child, you know, and my husband is also six foot five. So I thought there's no way you could live in a camper. You're a giant. Mm -hmm. And well, I rented a, I rented a camper off Airbnb.com on the way from New York to Alabama. And it was kind of a trial because he had joked about the camper and secretly I thought, you know, I really do like to live simply and minimally. Maybe I would like it. And so I stayed in for one night and I literally turned on the TV and no joke, there was this couple who's very famous within my niche, but I didn't know yet. And they were on the TV buying an RV and they were probably 24 at the time. And I thought, if these kids can do it, I can do it. You know, what makes them so special? <laughs> and I called my husband up and I said, this RV isn't too bad. You know, maybe we should buy a camper. And my husband being the shopper he is was like, yes, we get to go shopping for a big <laughs> ticket item. Let's do it. And um, as we were driving more throughout our journey, we stayed at a hotel and another kind of serendipitous thing happened, you know, and so we went, we looked at the campers and we realized how affordable they were and um, realized they make them big now. So my giant of a husband could fit in. I made him lay in the bed, walk to every square foot, get in the shower, get in the bathroom, close the door, everything to make sure he would be comfortable. And so when we finally did get to Alabama, we found an RV on the side of the road, um, went in, bought it the very next day. We didn't have a truck. It was a big fifth wheel. If you know what that is, like a gooseneck trailer. We didn't have a truck. We drove a Subaru station wagon, but they delivered it. And once we got into it, to make this uh, short story even longer, <laughs> uh, once we got into it, we realized that people do this on the road. I wanted to start a blog about it. And I realized, you know, there are thousands of others <laughs> with blogs <laughs> and, um, we realized we could do this and slowly over the next 12 months, my husband worked his way out of the military and I started building up my website, building up my uh, writing. And now we are on the road and we have been on the road less than 30 days, <laughs> but in the RV for about a year and a half now. Cool. That's cool. Thanks. And, uh, that, was a, that was a fascinating story. Even, if you thought it was long, it didn't seem like it to me. So. Oh, thanks. <laughs> now, uh, you've also had some success with Facebook Live in your group. Uh, to tell us some of the things that have worked best when you've done that. Sure. I love to talk about Facebook Live because it is one of my favorite things to do in my business. Um, I obviously love to write, but I love to talk even more. <laughs> so Facebook Live is where it's at for me. And um, if you're in the writing business, if you're in the online space, you need to be paying attention to algorithm, algorithms, excuse me, in the online world. And Facebook Live is right here on top of that. It, if you go live, Facebook wants other people to see it. It is Facebook's 
quote unquote product. So they want to push it out there. So if you're not doing Facebook live, you're doing a disservice to your business, in my opinion, but best practices for it. I've been doing Facebook live for over a year now. And of course it's evolved. And so I've had to evolve. And so I've got a couple tips for you guys. Um, I wrote them down because I think it's, I, Facebook Live is that important that I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget anything. Once you get comfortable, you need to be going live about once a week. And don't go live just for the sake, because Liz Wilcox told you you have to go live once a week. You need a purpose and you need a call to action. You know, even when you're writing, you need a purpose. Is it to entertain? Is it to inform? Is it to educate? You know, those things. Your Facebook Live has to be the same or people are going to keep scrolling because you're just rambling. Um, a visual tip for you is don't hold your camera. You know, nobody wants to see up your nose. Like, <laughs> you, you know, even if you're back here, nobody wants, you're still too close. Like right now we're filming and I have my computer like more than arm's length away. That way you're kind of getting an image instead of just my face. So if at all costs, don't hold your camera, especially if you're educating people. People, you know, your hand's shaking, you're probably super nervous. <laughs> and so, you know, that's even more um, noticeable if you're holding your camera. So find a place to prop it up and do it that way. You can go live on your laptop which makes for better video quality and it's easier for your camera to be far away. Um, back to always having a purpose and a call to action, whether that's go check out my site, sign up for my email list, even something like, you know, share this video or comment on this video. That can be your call to action to get more people, to get that Facebook algorithm going so more people see your page. Um, you want to get people engaged and serious. This is why I love Facebook live so much because I have researched this and it really works. There are certain things you can do to get people engaged. Ask for likes. say, Hey, if you're popping in like the, you know, like this video. And something that I love to do is if um, I'm doing a video where I'm doing a giveaway or, you know, someone just made their first comment. The one thing I try, I've been trying to do the last few weeks and that has really skyrocketed my videos where I'm getting, you know, close to a thousand views on a three minute video. I'm getting 40 to 60 comments, you know, within the first 24 hours mm. is asking people who are watching the replay to comment and say hello. When mm. you, you know, when you're doing a Facebook live, you say, Hey, if you're popping in say hi, mm. you know, that's something you hear a lot of people but also say, if you're watching the replay, say, hey, Liz, that way I know you watched it and I can give you a shout out. People yeah. love that. So that is one of my biggest tips. And seriously, just in the last three weeks, I've started doing it and it has gone, you know, my engagement level has been okay, but now it's amazing where, and I'm continuously being able to interact. So if someone is watching it within the first 24 hours, then I come back and say, hey, Donna, thanks for watching the replay. That way Facebook sees it again and puts it out to even more people. And then someone else watches it, you know, 48 hours. Hey, Tyler, thanks for popping in. And it just keeps going, going, going. That way your video is relevant, you know, for weeks at a time, really. And um, I think I had one more tip. Let me <laughs> refer to my notes. Um, Oh, just, just respond to every comment. You know, Facebook is really about, you know, likes, comments, and shares have weight to them. So the more likes you have, the heavier your video is. So you want to go back and you want to keep conversing and do it in an authentic way. Just don't say thanks. You know, shout them out. Hey, thanks, Frank. You know, I loved seeing that picture of your dog yesterday or whatever. If you relate to them on Facebook and you see them every day, make it personal. And people are going to go through, you know, if they see a video, maybe they're at work and they can't actually turn it on, but they can click on the comments and see what people are saying. And if you're engaged with your audience, people are going to love that. And they're going to, you know, watch that video. Oh, and something else that Facebook just started, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago, 
now you can have the sort of like Snapchat filters on it and you can have masks and you can play games and, you know, I like to do one with like a crown when I'm talking about, you know, I'm feeling good <laughs> and people love those. It just keeps it a little more interesting. So when people are scrolling, they're like, Oh, this lady's got a clown mask on. I'm going to watch that, you know, and make it personal to you. You know, if having a clown mask on doesn't make sense for your video, cause you're talking about grief, obviously don't do that, but there are ways to, you know, make it interesting. So when you are on Facebook Live and you're announcing something or you're giving a big shout out to someone or something really exciting is happening and you're announcing it, you want to ask people to give a round of applause and you just, you know, show them on your phone and you just say, keep hitting the like button, like button, like button, like button. And that way um, there's more likes on your video, more engagement and Facebook sees that and makes it heavier. And you can tell them to hit the heart button, the ha ha button whatever you want. You know, if you say something funny and you're like, oh, it really makes me feel good when you guys show me some love, like hit the love button, hit the ha ha button. And that way people, because some people really just don't know to do that. And of course your followers love you. That That's why they follow you. And anything that you ask for that's going to help you, that's easy for them, they're going to do it. And doing this, seriously, super easy. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, sure is. Okay, um, you tell a lot of stories too. Tell us how a writer can use stories to hook readers and to, to make their point more effectively. Okay, well, it's always been my belief that, you know, storytelling is the way that we connect with each other. And if you look online and you see social media, you can tell that storytelling is coming back as an art form in a really big way. People are consuming stories like crazy. And I mean, it only makes sense. That's how we communicate with each other. If you look at social media and you're scrolling through your phone all day, you're seeing everyone's story, you know, 24 hours a day, whenever you're connected, you're going to work and you're telling stories. Um, let your story be part of your message you know, share anecdotes, share those little things when you're trying to prove a point that because like I said previously, you know, your followers follow you because they love you, you know, let them in a little bit. It's not, I don't know, I guess it is more expected from readers nowadays. You know, if you're doing, for an example, if you're, re if you're just doing an easy top 10 list, you know, within my niche, you know, top 10 rookie mistakes you can make in an RV, you know, what is going to separate that article from the 20,000 that are already out there? My personal story, my personal rookie mistakes. So when I'm talking about, you know, driving down the road and going 70 when I should be going 60 because, you know, this is literally a home on wheels, I'm going to talk about the time that I had to slam on my brakes and all the plates came flying from the cupboard, you know, and that's really going to make my article stand out. So whatever you're writing about, think about those stories that happened to you or someone, you know, or that are really relatable and just share that in an authentic way. And it's really going to make your article stand out. Awesome. Awesome. And I could just see the plates coming forward as you talked about <laughs> uh, slamming on the brakes when you were <laughs> driving. Yeah, yeah, it can happen. <laughs> I hope none of them broke, right? No, I only have plastic wear. We got rid of all of our, even the Corel, it'll break. So we have like big lots, uh, plastic. This is my cup. It's just a giant plastic <laughs> mug <laughs> that I carry around <laughs> with me. That's funny. You don't think about that kind of thing when you live in a, a, a house that doesn't move. So, Right. Yeah, it's totally different. But yeah, just for me, I like to use humor and hyperbole, you know, like exaggerate. Like the story I just told you, it actually wasn't. It was just one plate. It wasn't plates. But if you use that little bit of exaggeration, it really brings the story to life. So, you know, of course, if you're a grief counselor, you know, you're not going to use as much humor but if you know how to write a story in a empathetic way, or, you know, if you're, uh, I'm trying to think, like if you're just a writer about um, real life and 
how to self-care, if you can use drama in a way that works with your story and works for your audience, you know, you have to find kind of your writing voice and use that to your advantage in your stories to get your point across. Absolutely. Uh, you did mention humor. I'd like to explore that a little bit more. Uh, what are some easy ways for a writer who maybe isn't used to you know, seeing the world with a sense of humor to incorporate that into their work, you know, without, you know, fearing that they won't be taken seriously? Yeah. So I've always loved humor. It's something that I've used to I guess, come out of my shell. I grew up really shy. I was a really anxious kid. And knowing me now, you wouldn't know. But I did, I really used humor. And I think that no matter what you do um, for a living and no matter what you write about, there's always that little edge of humor that you can use because it's the way we connect. You know, even when you're telling a story like this in person, you know, you always kind of, have those side jabs or, you know, something to get people listening again, because we all tune out. We're all just kind of waiting for our turn to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing, you have to do that even more because there's so many distractions. If I'm just reading or scrolling through my phone, you know, I could look up at any minute, but if you're continuously making me laugh or even, you know, making me think in a humorous way, then I'm going to keep reading your words. So what I do, my number one tip for learning how to use humor is just to read your stuff out loud like you are talking to your reader. I mean, we all have that certain avatar, that reader that we're writing to. You know, we want this person to read it so bad, right? So, you know, just read it out loud. Is this how you would talk, you know? Is, or is this some weird voice that you're not even sure who is writing this? And because like we said, you want your reader to be in on your story. That's why they follow you nowadays. Storytelling is so big. <clears throat> so, you know, write something, read it out loud. Ask yourself, what would I say right now to make someone smile? about this point I'm making or to make them think or whatever you're trying to provoke them to do. If you're trying to provoke them to a call to action, what would I say right now to make them do what I want them to do? What would I say right now to make them burst out laughing? What would I say to make them chuckle at this? And I find that, you know, everyone talks. So it's much easier when you say it out loud for that to naturally, naturally answer itself and so if you check out my writing I actually personally I use a lot of parentheses maybe like one a paragraph you know which is a side note that I would say I would literally say that out loud and I find nowadays with social media being so popular and you know everyone and their mother and their grandmother having a blog people can read that more easily you know what I mean mm -hmm. so um you know, try, try different things, try writing in a different style and maybe putting it out there. And if you're afraid, that's good. That means you're growing. <laughs> I'm afraid every day, like, oh gosh, did, and is this going to offend someone? Is this too much? Does this make any sense? And of course, you know, sometimes those things will happen and you just have to revise and that's how your writing gets better if you continue to just write the same way, you're only going to attract that one person or that one group that maybe you want to grow. So just experiment. Um, do the Facebook lives. I think that with the writing really helps me because my audience knows the way that I speak. And so they're reading it the way that I'm saying it on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. I think one of the greatest compliments a writer can get is when someone says, I read this in your voice. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like when someone's like, oh, I can hear you saying that. That is when you know you have really found your voice and that writer or that reader knows exactly who you are. And so back to the tip, <laughs> You know, just say it out loud. Does it, is this how you would say it? 
And if it's not, or it needs to be more formal, of course, there's always some tweaking you can do, but just find what sounds good and try it out. And if you don't like it the next time, tweak it a little more. I love that, that uh, tip you gave about reading your writing out loud and finding your voice that way. And it really is true. If you want to stand out and be the individual that you are, you definitely need to hear what you've written. And right. that's a, the key to engagement for sure. Yeah. Cause it's totally different. You know, of course, when I'm writing for that company, you know, there's much less of my voice in it. And I can do that in reverse. I write something, I read it out loud and I think, uh, this is too much, Liz, you know, for a company. And so I'm able to take it out at the same time. And I think the more you do it, the more practice you get, the easier it is to go back and forth when you need to write that serious article or when you need to really hit it home with humor. Absolutely. Yeah, I like that. The way you kind of dial it depending on the situation, but still right. leave enough of you in there so that it's not boring and oh, uh, yeah, nobody totally. wants to read it. So. Okay, so tell us, uh, what are you working on now that you'd like to tell us about? Sure. Awesome. Thank you for asking this because I am getting so excited. Just like you, I am branching out on YouTube and trying that out. Mm -hmm. um, but I am going to start my own talk show because as you can tell, I like to talk and I have a lot to say. <laughs> but it's going to be something that's totally different, something that I haven't seen too much in the online space, especially on a, you know, single like solo entrepreneur level. I'm going to be doing, they're going to be 30 to 45 minutes long and just think late night, you know, when you have someone come in and the host does a monologue and then they do, you know, like a, who was it? Like Jay Leno or Letterman was famous for their top tens. I'm going to be doing something like that. And then I'm going to have an in-person interview where I'm actually with someone within my niche and hoping to interview people that are famous within my niche and get viewers like that and just really work together to multiply our audiences and then at the end, I'm hoping to, you know, wrap up the segment with the latest trends. I have three business pillars in my business, storytelling, humor, and trends. So this talk show is going to encompass all three in one show. It's going to be in seasons. And I'm just really excited because I think it's totally different. One of my mottos is when everyone is zigging, you zag. And so this is what I'm trying to do. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be so much work, but um, kind of like we talked about, just get to know yourself. And I think that this is going to be the best for me with my book that I compiled. And I did a virtual summit with some friends where I hosted and I did something like 15 hours of live streaming in five days. And it just was so fun for me. And I also love writing humor like we just talked about. So this is going to allow me to write those segments and really come out of my shell in writing and be able to perform at the same time. So it's something I'm really excited about. It's just going to be called what my site is called the virtual campground. It makes sense as a show name too. And I'm just really excited and I'm really excited for your show too. So congrats on it. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a great show and it definitely yeah. will draw all those pillars together and then, uh, as soon as you get a link for it, I'd love to put it on the show notes on this page. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. It's going, it isn't going to be released until March. Right now, I am starting filming and um, getting the interviews lined up for February. And then I'll be spending a whole ton of time editing, and it will be launched March 4th, I believe. So I'm really excited. Wow, that's, that's coming up quick. <laughs> Yes, it is. I was, <laughs> I set pretty aggressive deadlines for myself. So fingers crossed. I set it on video. Now I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So maybe we can try to get this out there before March 4th. So people can be thinking about it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, you've given us a lot to think about and use today and we appreciate it all. And uh, thank you for being on the program. 
Awesome. Thanks, Frank. Have a good day. Thanks. You too, Liz. Bye. Bye.